Thank you once again for being with us on tonight. We're continuing in the series, The Courage to Continue. Our text, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 28. And we're reading from the New Living Translation. The Apostle Paul is actually standing to present his credentials because there are many false teachers, false apostles who have permeated the church at Corinth and in an effort to protect the church, to protect the followers of Christ, the people of God, he gives us his credentials so that we can be assured of the authority by which he preaches the gospel and he oversees the churches that God has called him to establish. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a mad man or a foolish man, but I have served him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 30, 39 lashes. <laughs> Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. That's a lot, wouldn't you say? He's not finished. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and often gone without food. <laughs> I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. This is lesson number three in the series entitled, The Courage to Continue. We've asked the question, can any of us possibly relate to the Apostle Paul? Just a little bit. And maybe not to the same degree or magnitude because we've not had the experiences that the Apostle Paul experienced. Considering in life today the pain, the disappointments, the challenges, we must all face in life at some season, at some point or another. Do we have the courage to continue amid whatever life hurls at us? Do we have the courage to continue? And may I submit to us that just as it takes discipline to walk with God, it takes courage to continue walking with Christ. And courage is not automatic. Courage is something that we develop as we spend time with God and as we experience God and as we go through the experiences of life that really yell at us, quit, give up, back down, stop. A point of emphasis tonight, the commands of Christ require courage. When we consider what God has mandated, what God has commanded, when we consider the standard that God calls us to live by and the standard that he calls us to lift up before others, it requires courage. The commands of Christ require courage. And all throughout the pages of biblical history, we see that 
many had an opportunity to quit. Some did. And then there were those who had the courage to persevere. Often the word quit, we learn, can, can ring so, so much louder, can scream so much louder in our hearing, in our ears, than any degree of hope we find in life that we often wait for the turnaround. We wait for the light of day. We wait for the morning to come. We wait for the hope, renewed vision, and inspired dreams. We wait. And the reality is, it takes courage. Courage to remain in the fight. Courage to press, to persevere. Courage to stand. And so we're going to look at some people in scripture who had the courage to persevere, and then maybe share some of our, our own uh, life stories wherein we've been just mandated by God to hold a steady course. Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. This is the New King James Version. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho, this is Jesus, with his disciples, and a great multitude or crowd of people, blind Bartimaeus. His name means honorable, but he was a blind man, the son of Timaeus. His father's name means highly prized. He sat by the road begging, and that's what beggars did during this particular time. They had no means of support, and, 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 and many would not have anything to do with them or support them, and so they would sit along the roadside and they would beg. Bartimaeus was such a one. Verse 47, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, descendant of David, you're the Messiah, have mercy on me. Wow. Then many warned him to be quiet. They told him, shut up. But he cried out all the more. When others told him to be quiet, to, to, to shut up, he cried, the Bible says, all the more, son of David, descendant of David. In other words, have mercy on me. We understand that he recognized that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, a descendant of David, and he knows that Jesus can help him. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they, the same ones who told him to shut up, the same ones who told him to be quiet, the, the same ones who tried to discourage him, then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer or be of good courage. They weren't saying that initially. Rise, he is calling you. And notice something that this beggar does, blind Bartimaeus, and throwing aside his garment. This was his beggar's garment, a beggar's robe. That's what they wore, identifying them as beggars. He throws it off. I wonder why. I believe he throws aside this garment, his beggar's garment, because based upon his belief in the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the son of David, he recognized that if he could just get to him, and if Jesus would just touch him, he wouldn't need his beggar's robe anymore. He would not be the same man if he could just have an encounter with Christ. So he, throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Please pay attention. The blind man said to him, Rabboni, master teacher, that I may receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now, how many of us have, have, have ever been in that place? I wonder what would have happened if, if blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, had not continued on in courage, 
crying out the more. I wonder what would have happened if he had just shut his mouth, if he had made a decision to, to be quiet, to do what the others told him to do. Just be quiet. Don't mess with Jesus. Just shut up. I wonder what would have happened to him. And he could have quit, but at what cost? He would have never received his sight. And I wonder how many times we have been there, whether it was the devil or it was our own inner critic counseling us, or perhaps it was a family member or a colleague or a friend saying, be quiet, shut up, give it up, resign. You'll never win. It's just too difficult. It's just not going to work out. The business, the marriage, the ministry, it'll fail. You don't have what it takes. You're not educated enough. You're not smart enough. You don't have the looks. You don't have the right connections. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. Give it up. Quit. Whether the devil, our own inner critic, or someone close to us, have we ever been in that place where somebody told us, just be quiet, just shut up? And what would have happened if this man had obeyed the crowd? What would have happened if he lacked the courage to continue? And instead of quitting, the Bible says he began to cry out all the more. It takes courage to continue. When the odds are stacked against you, and when everything around you looks like disaster. Luke 8, 43 through 48. New King James Version. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. Have you been there? You see, some of us, we, we complain because you've been in it for a month. You've been in it for a minute, right? Maybe a year, maybe two, maybe six months. But what would you do if you had to press your way 12 years, 18 years, 30 years? Would you have the courage to continue? The Bible says this woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, many of us, we haven't suffered that long. We act like we have. Who had spent all her livelihood on physicians, every dime she had, and could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment. She had the courage to continue. Now remember, she's a bleeding woman. She's not supposed to touch Christ or anybody else because then they are defiled or they are ceremonially unclean. It is against the law for her to be out bleeding. She didn't care anything about that. She had the courage to continue. I'm sure she counted the cost. The scripture says that she came from behind and she touched the border or the hem of his garment, the garment of Christ, and immediately, people pay attention please, immediately her flow of blood stopped. It's not possible to touch God and not get results. It is not possible to spend time with him and to believe in him, and to trust him, and to cry out to him, and not get results. It's not possible. I think the issue is that, have we really touched him? Have we ever touched him? You see, it's not possible to touch him, and he not touch us. It is not possible to touch him, and we not see the answer to our prayers. And immediately her flow of blood stopped, and Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. Now, all these people out here, this multitude, this, this huge crowd, everybody bumping up against each other, touching each other, and how is it that you say that somebody touched you? Surely somebody touched you. But Jesus is saying, no, not in the way you think. And Scripture says that, when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude strong and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody, somebody touched me. Now, understand, he actually knew who touched him. But this is the distinction. Somebody touched me, for I perceived it was a different kind of touch. 
It was a touch of courage. It was a touch of faith. I perceived power going out from me. The pull was so great. The courage so great. The faith so great. The intensity of heart so great that it pulled power from me. And is that possible? That we could pray and pray and pray and press in and seek the face of God and touch God to the degree wherein we actually summons the power of God, we pull the power of God into our very being. Perceived power going out from me, that's what Jesus says. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, because she knew what was going on inside of her body, she came trembling and, and falling down before him, she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. She felt it in her own body. Jesus felt the power oozing out of him, flowing out of him into her, and she felt the power permeating her. And he said to her, notice, he doesn't call her by name, he simply calls her daughter, very endearing daughter. Be of good cheer, be of good courage. Your faith your confidence in me, your belief in me, your trust in me is what made you well. And then he speaks very calming words, go in peace. So what would have happened if this woman did not have the courage to continue? What would have happened if she just stayed home? She spent all of her money. She's gone to doctor after doctor. Couldn't find healing in every physician that she went to. What would have happened if she decided to just stay home and resign herself to this condition? Mark 7, 25 through 30. It's the New King James Version. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, Syrophoenician by birth, a Gentile, in other words, she's not a covenant person. She's not in relationship with God. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. She's bugging him. She's begging. She's pleading. She refuses to let go. She refuses to give up. She wants Jesus to cast this demon out of her child. Verse 27, but Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first. Now, understanding the covenant that he had with the Jews, this woman is outside of that covenant arrangement. Jesus says, well, the benefits go first to the children, the children of the covenant. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So he's speaking to her Gentile position. Verse 28, and she answered, now remember that's the terminology of the day. And he's not saying, you dog, no. It was the terminology of the day, speaking to those who were estranged from God or not in covenant with God. And she answered and said to him, yes, Lord. Now, she didn't have an attitude because she could have turned around. Who are you calling a dog? She could have had an attitude. Uh, she could have left without what she needed. But she had the courage to continue, not being offended, not being sensitive, not wearing her feelings on her shoulders. Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. It's all right. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Now that could be a series in and of itself because many times uh, when we have issues going on with our children, we don't recognize demonic activity or the presence of demons. Yet they are very real. And many times our children are overtaken by demonic assault. And we don't even recognize it. This woman, not even in covenant, recognized that this was a demon and needed to intercede for her daughter. And she had the courage to continue. She refused to quit. And how many times have we prayed one time, we don't see the results that we want, and we give up, we back down. So for this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, God cannot lie. 
she found the demon gone. You see, God, Jesus didn't have to go to her house to speak to a demon to cast the demon out. He's God. Jesus Christ, he's the son of God. He has authority over demons. And so he took care of the situation right where he was, right where she was. So when she got home, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. She could have quit, but at what cost? Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, could have quit, but at what cost? The woman with the issue of blood could have quit, but at what cost? The apostle Paul could have quit, but at what cost? And the lesson challenges us tonight because you can quit. You can give up. You can abandon the courage to continue, but at what cost? And what about Jesus Christ? He could have quit. When we read Isaiah chapter 53, we see the Son of God intense and committed to going the distance for you and for me so that salvation is made possible. He could have quit, but at what cost? That would have meant for you and for me that we would be eternally lost because there would be no way to get back to God. Matthew 26, 39, in the New King James Version, Jesus could have quit. He went a little farther and he fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Forget how I'm feeling. Forget how bad this journey is, is going to be. Considering what they're going to do to me, forget all of that. Your will be done. A point of emphasis, you should remember this, without the courage to continue, no assignment is brought to completion and no reward is ever enjoyed. No assignment is brought to completion, and no reward is ever enjoyed. Jesus Christ is ultimately our example. We look at blind Bartimaeus. We look at the woman with the issue of blood. We look at the Syrophoenician woman. We look at the Apostle Paul, but ultimately, Jesus Christ is our example. He had the courage to continue. And thank God that he did. We're going to look back at Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a, a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off, strip off every weight, every encumbrance or form of oppression, anything that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And you know what that sin is. And let us run with endurance. Can you see it? The race, the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping, can you see this? Keeping our eyes on Jesus, not your circumstances. All of our circumstances are temporal. They're fleeting, passing away, subject to change. The only person we can keep our eyes on who empowers us to go the distance is God Almighty, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him, you see. He could see beyond the cross. He could see beyond the grave. He could see the joy of many sons and daughters entering into the family of God, so he says, because of the joy awaiting him, he had the courage to continue. He endured the cross. He had the courage to continue, no matter how difficult. There was a goal, there was a prize, there was something ahead that he was looking to. He kept his eyes on that. And if we don't keep our eyes on the goal, on the prize, on the Christ, we won't have the courage to continue. Disregarding its shame, can you see it? Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become, listen, weary and give up or faint in your mind. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Where does this leave us? 
Now, people, pay attention, because if it's not today, if it's not tomorrow, in your future, you'll be faced with these wonderful opportunities to give up and to quit. The courage to continue is possible. But you've got to want to persevere, want to endure. And you cannot, listen, you cannot, if you're going to stay the course, you cannot look at what's temporary, what's subject to change. Reverend and I could have quit years ago. Standing under the most vicious scrutiny, we could have quit years ago. Ostracized and criticized, we could have quit years ago. Standing as a female pastor and persecuted, not by the sinners. I've, I've not received one assault from a sinner concerning my position as a female pastor. I've been persecuted by the church, the professed followers of Christ. Accused of being out of line and, of course, too stern. It doesn't take all of that. Judged harshly. We could have quit a long time ago. Misunderstood by many. Taken for granted. Laboring hours. Counseling people. Visiting the sick and going to the prisons. Going all the way, listen, pocket deep. Praying with people. And praying for people and Enduring people gossiping about me and gossiping about a reverend and then gossiping about our children. Could have quit a long time ago. Sacrificing my own health and my own well-being. Sacrificing time spent with our children. And to this day, our children have some serious issues because they, they, they felt that we spent so much time with members who left the church and counseled people for hours when they wanted to have family activities. And we pray about it even to this day that, that God would heal them of, of what they hold in their hearts so that they can flourish and they can blossom. We withstood the assaults coming from leaders in ministry. We could have quit a long time ago. Sacrificing relationships with our families, only to watch, listen, many of the people that we labored with or that we counseled or that we helped, we watched them leave the church and then build their own ministries and their own churches off of our labor. We could have quit a long time ago. We've served people who have left this church and then try to pull people out of this church. We could have quit a long time ago, you see. But your focus cannot be on the behavior of people. And Reverend and I rehearsed this over and over and over. Your focus can never be on the behavior of people or the temporal situations and circumstances. Your focus can't be on uh, people saying evil things about you. You can never get into a place where you try to defend yourself or qualify yourself. You see, God qualifies us and God defends us. We could have quit a long time ago. But there's something about having a relationship with God, and knowing that when God has his hand on you, we've seen God do too much. We have watched him answer too many prayers. We have seen God transform the lives of people. We have seen God honor his word. How could we give up? How could we quit? How could we back down just because we face a hard place or a difficult season or a difficult day? You see, the blessedness comes when I can believe God in spite of. And always understand, you treat people the way you want to be treated, whether they ever treat you that way or not. You see, we don't do tit for tat and railing for railing and evil for evil. Let God vindicate you. You must be a person who knows how to commune with God. And that's all the leverage you need to get through from one day to the next we could have quit, listen, a long time ago, but at what cost? At what cost? What would we have forfeited? What would we have lost? What reward would we have walked away from if we did not have the courage to continue? And you talk about have seen some stuff. We've seen some stuff. Things that we could never share publicly. But listen, if I could encourage you, they have served to the shaping of us 
and the making of us. And over the years, we've tried to teach the people of God that you grow in the hard places. And pressure is essential because pressure will always squeeze out of us what's in us. We need pressure. We need the crisis. We need the storm. We need the hard places. And we do need a test of our faith. Whose report will you believe? The courage to continue. As the followers of Christ, understand this. And a lot of what pastor's sharing, please understand, it requires maturity. You got to go through something. And you grow. And you grow and you keep growing. And the issue, listen, as long as we are in time, we're going to be growing or we're regressing or we're just standing still. We ain't doing nothing. You're regressing, you're standing still, or you're growing as long as we're in time. Now, if we're going to be beneficial to the kingdom and if we're going to glorify God, we must be people who are serious about growing and developing and maturing. And you got to rise above your feelings as you can't walk in courage if you're ruled by your feelings. You won't be able to continue in courage if every little thing hurts you, every little thing sets you off, ticks you off, pushes you back. You won't be able to continue in courage. As followers of Christ, we live in a fallen world that is hostile to our faith in Jesus Christ. I had to go and um, have uh, blood work done, and the person um, drawing blood was from the Philippines. And he began to talk to me about his faith. And he says, you know, I don't know how people make it if they don't pray. And many people walk in here and, and I say to them, I don't know how you make it if you don't pray. And he, he talked about the different challenges, but, but the world is hostile to our faith in Christ. He talked about the hostility towards the the vaccines and all that people listen to. And, and he said, you know, if, if they don't want it here where they have a, such a tremendous supply, they could send it to the Philippines. They could send it to people who really have an appreciation for what this country despises or dismisses. It's, it's unfortunate that we're so superficial, so shallow, that we have yet to understand that when God looks at us, we are ministers. So the person taking blood was a minister. And I began to share my faith with this individual. The doctors attending to our care, they're ministers, you see. The scientist, that's a minister. Even a police officer, a minister, law enforcement. See, we tend to, to think of people in the pulpit or teaching a small group or a Sunday school class, that's a minister. No, ministers transcend the pulpit. God has a minister in a library. He has a minister as a teller in a financial institution or in a classroom, a minister. And yet we share our faith in a hostile world. And we must be bold enough, courageous enough to share Christ wherever we go. As followers of Christ, we face daily internal and external struggles, challenges, all of us. We're sensitive, those of us who are followers of Christ, because we're born again, we have the nature of God, and now we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, but we have these internal and, and external challenges, and sometimes the internal challenges are greater than the external. And then there's the power of the Holy Spirit who enables us to hold a steady course to persevere, to not quit, to not give up. As followers of Christ, we must strive in an ungodly culture and understand this, you got to have courage considering the culture. And we've learned this, that we don't follow crowds or the culture, we follow Christ. And we allow the Christ in us to so shape us, transform us, so that we're able to take Christ to the culture, to the crowds, to the world, to the nations. 
As followers of Christ, we must contend with our own fallen nature. You see, we're encased in the body of sin. And the Apostle Paul made the statement, the good that I would, I do not, the evil I would not, that I do, or wretched man that I am. He talked about desiring to do good, and yet evil was always present with him. He was talking about his fallen nature, the body of sin. And this body of death, we have to contend with until we go home to be with the Lord. Because the body has not been saved. My spirit saved. My mind renewed by the word of God. But the body represents the fallen nature. It's the flesh. And we have to contend with it. And the courage we need to deal with this body, we get this courage from our Father. And then worst of all, we have to contend with the relentless attacks of our adversary, the devil. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if we don't understand this, if we don't recognize this, we'll find ourselves just floundering around in life. The courage to continue is possible. But you're going to have to have some intestinal fortitude, spiritual tenacity. You can't be spiritually impaired in your hearing. You cannot be suffocating in your faith. What does that mean? You're not feeding your, your faith the fuel that it needs. That's the Word of God. That's communion with God. That's being a part of a community holding us accountable. The courage to continue is possible. It comes at a high cost. And not everybody has the courage to continue. We've watched it for many years. I'm grateful to God that we have persevered. As we're able to see the fruit of our labor, we're able to see many sons and daughters transformed by the Word of God. And you see, you got to be proud of the fact that God wants to use you to touch the lives of others. We've learned this. Time of Celebration knows this. We birth nations into the kingdom of God one life at a time. The emphasis is on the male seed because he is the seed carrier. He carries the family, he carries the community, he carries the nation. But when God looks at you, he doesn't just see you. He sees every life that you will touch because of what he's doing on the inside of you. And so he sees nations. He sees generations. You have to have a press in you to continue and not give up, not fall along the way or faint in your mind because it gets hard. It gets hard for all of us. It gets difficult. The struggles are real. I understand it. But you have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, you have the power of God on the inside of you. And he gives you the courage to continue. I'm not finished. We've got a, a ways to go in the teaching. But I pray that you've heard the Spirit of God. Just encourage you to hold a steady course. Don't give up. Don't quit. He is the God who sees you. He's the God who will help you. And he's the God who will never leave you nor forsake you. His word is sure. And that we can hold on to. When you can't hold on to anything else, I can assure you of this, you can hold on to the word of God. We can't ever have a service without uh, extending an invitation to those who perhaps don't know Christ to enter into the family of God and to get to know him. It takes a village, it, it takes the body of Christ, it takes a community, and, and maybe you haven't heard me over the past several months or weeks when it comes to God's plea for you to return to him. Maybe you'll hear another voice, another minister, another messenger. And so Brother Herbert is going to offer up the call to Christ. To those of you who are not born again, or to those of you perhaps you're backslidden, or maybe you're saved, but... Uh, you just need us to fan the flame. Then let's, uh, let's just receive from him, and then I'll give us a closing prayer uh, for this evening. One thing that I believe God has put on my heart tonight, and it's very, very simple, is that he's calling you. He's calling me. He's not calling us to necessarily minister. He's not calling us to preach. He's not calling us to teach right now. He's calling us back to himself. He's calling you to him, and he's calling me even the one giving this call to Christ. He's calling us on tonight. 
and what would be foolish of all of us, whether we are already saved or whether we've been hearing God not for quite a while now, would be to press the ignore button on his phone call. We do that so often to people, but it would behoove us to not do that to God, not on tonight. I, on my way over here, I looked at a video from some Afghan girls crying out for help. And I want to tell you that on the inside, maybe you don't recognize it, but your soul is crying out for help, and God's here to help you on tonight. And what I'm asking you to do is the same thing God has asked me to do, which I have done, and that is answer the call. The call back to him, the call back to intimacy, the call to accept the great work that he's already done. The verse that sticks out is, for God so loved the world. He doesn't just love you, and I'm in awe. He doesn't just love me. He so loves us. You're an awesome God. You're a mighty God. You're an amazing God. And you're worthy of our worship even when we're going through the valleys. You've taught us that if we aren't faithful in the valley, we'll never see the mountaintop. So, God, we ask you to come into our hearts. If you are willing to accept them, just repeat these words after me. Come into my heart. I accept what you did on the cross. I accept that call to repentance. And I say on today that, God, I repent. God, I love you. I want to know you, and I want to serve you. Help me in those areas that don't want to serve you, those areas that don't want to know you. Help my unbelief. Those areas, God, where we don't believe. Help our unbelief. God loves you on tonight. And God has forgiven you. And God is calling out to you tonight. And I ask you, and on behalf of Jesus, I don't ask you, it's not Gabriel, it's not Herbert, it's Jesus. He said, don't let my work be in vain. Accept what I did for you and give your life over to me. If you said that prayer, I would advise you to uh, contact us here at the church so that we can send out some troops to help uh, solidify you in what you, the decision you just made. If you've come back to Christ, it's real simple. Just pick back up where you left off. Tonight, when this sermon is over, don't go turn the TV on. Don't go hop into bed. Get on your knees. Get your Bible out and spend some more time with God, reconnecting. I'm going to turn the service back over to the pastor. Have a great night. Very good, sir. Very good. Praise the Lord. Thank you all so much for streaming in on tonight. Our prayer is that you're born again, that you're filled with God's spirit, and that you live out your faith in a Christian community so that we can truly be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Should Jesus tarry, you can be a part of our in-person service on tomorrow night at 730, our Sunday morning in-person worship experience, or you can continue to stream in. But just know that we love you and that we pray for you. And we thank God for your commitment to lift him up so that all the earth's people will know that our God is God. He's Elikad, the Lord our God is one. Father, we thank you so much for every life, every home, every family. Thank you for your word as it has gone forth on tonight. It shall not return unto you void. It will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto you've sent it. I pray that the blood of Jesus covers every home, every family, every life. I pray angels are encamped around about every home, every family, every life. I pray, O oh God, that you uphold us with your righteous right hand, that you keep us, that you order our steps and that you establish our goings. You lead us in the way that we should go. Redeem our lives from destruction. Keep us from pestilences and plagues and sudden calamity. Holy Spirit, keep us from falling. Present us faultless before the Father's presence with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, honor, dominion, and power, now henceforth and forevermore. And the church said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great night.